We're going to start with the cardiology problem set. Uh, this here, I'm just going to briefly review. This is just informing you the location of the MI, which leads to look at. We're also going to look at the coronary anatomy. I reviewed this in the lecture part uh, on Monday, but I know the videos were not posted yet, so I'll just briefly review this. Okay, so when you're uh, looking at the 12 lead EKG, right, and this is your standard 12 lead EKG here, right? So you see how I have grid lines in, in this, right? So I have the grid lines. This is what I'm talking about, these lines that subdivide different portions, right? So if you look, there is actual leads that corresponds to every single box here, right? And the way, uh, the way that the 12 lead ECG machine does this is actually... Uh, it measures this, right, for the whole duration. So there will be like a six second worth of it, but it cuts it up into these fragments so that it could build a 12 dd kg. In a hospital machine, the GE machines, right, the those fancy machines that they do 12 leads, if you wanted to, you could print out a 12 lead ECG with every single lead, uh, like six seconds long. So you could have lead one going, lead two, lead three. A lot of cardiologists and emergency doctors do that so that they get a longer length of the trip so they can better make interpretation when you have those rhythms that are uh, you know, not so clear. Or you need to measure those ST segment elevations that are not so clear cut. So uh, the 12 lead in itself is like cut, cut up into these segments, but if you wanted to, you could print out a longer strip. And the, these quadrants correspond to different uh, um, segments, right? And also different uh, coronary arteries on your heart. So coronary arteries, right, that you see here, they're around the heart like a crown, right? And uh, they supply blood to different portions of the heart. So here you see uh, the coronary arteries arising from your aortic ostia. Right, and here you see the right coronary artery, and the right coronary artery, as it makes its way down the heart, as I'm drawing here, right. What it feeds is actually feeds. If we start from the top, right, it actually feeds the SA node. It feeds the right atrium. It feeds the right ventricle, right, and as it's making its way down, it's going to feed the inferior wall of the heart. Uh, in, in addition to it, as it goes to the back there's a posterior descending artery it also feeds the the posterior wall of the ventricle right uh, it also feeds there's branches that come off and they also feeds the av node so if you see this is the electrical conduction of the heart so if there's damage or i should say there's a thrombus higher up in the vessel right if there's occlusion somewhere here you may have uh, you know circulation cut off to your si node to the av node so you may see a lot of Brady dysrhythmias uh, or heart blocks developing with right coronary artery occlusion, right? So this is the right coronary artery. This is what it feeds. And then on the left-hand side, we have the called the left coronary artery. Sometimes they call it left main. And left main, uh, you have basically two branches. The first branch is being left anterior de descending that is you see here. The left anterior descending feeds the septal wall of the heart uh, and it feel, feeds the left ventricle, right? Left atria and the left ventricle. So it, it is, it's making its way down here. Also you have the circumflex. So the circumflex is this uh, artery here. It kind of loops around it. So I'm gonna kind of take a different color and show you, um, see this, this is where it comes to the back of the heart. So because it's like this faded color, it basically it's going around uh, feeding the lateral wall, right? And it's coming down, it can also feed the inferior wall. So the inferior wall can be fed by both the right coronary and the left circumflex. Uh, and uh, every person's anatomy can slightly differ. So they may have a little longer branch, a little shorter branch. So every person's anatomy is not uniform. There's sl slight subdivision. There's also, uh, you know, the older you get, uh, you may have, um, certain vasculature developing, right? Uh, and they call it collateral circulation. Where, for example, someone who sustained a heart attack and they survived, they may have collateral circulation, basically uh, a new vasculature. 
So you may have slightly different um, um, perfusion, right, to the heart. Uh, so this is a good, like, uniform thing to learn, but there's some distinction between patient to patient. Uh, so it's not going to be the same for every single patient. Okay. Now, so that we saw this, and we saw how the 12 lead ECG looks like. So these, the chart below, it shows you, right, where you see changes on the EKG and what uh, wall of the heart it will essentially involve. So here we see leads 2, 3, AVF, they involve the inferior wall, right, inferior wall of the heart, which can be fed by right coronary artery. Usually that's the main one. You could also have the circumflex, right, that, that is uh, around the heart going back. Uh, then we're going to see we have septal wall right v1 v2 usually that's the left anterior de descending this is part of the left coronary artery so left anterior descending then you have the anterior wall right v3 v4 these leads v3 and v4 they're also fed by left anterior descending coronary artery right then you have the lateral leads right the lateral leads here and here Truly speaking, a true lateral wall is lead one and AVL, and this is the circumflex. Sometimes you may have uh, um, anterior lateral MI. And then you will have involvement. For example, you may have involvement of V4, V5, V6, one and AVL and you have basically enter lateral involvement. But tru truly speaking, the, the lateral wall uh, is lead one and AVL. The other important things that you guys need to be cognizant of, we talk about EKG changes, right? Uh, about what is uh, contiguous, right? So contiguous leads, they're basically looking at the same part of the heart. So we say uh, you want to see one millimeter ST segment elevation, and contiguously. So if you look at my arm, right, my my wrist here is contiguous to my forearm, right? It's not contiguous to my elbow. And there is a whole space, right? The wrist, the wrist, and then the then you have the forearm, then you have the elbow. So the wrist is contiguous to my forearm, the wrist is not contiguous to my elbow. And that's what you gotta be cognizant in your leads. So if I'm seeing elevations, right, for example, in lead 2, 3 AVF, those are contiguous because they look at the inferior wall. If I see V1, V2, they're also contiguous, right? Same thing for lateral leads. The If I see elevations, for example, in lead uh, V4, and then I see elevations in lead 3, right, those are not contiguous leads. So uh, that could be a different diagnosis or maybe a different pathology of the patient, right? Sometimes in pericarditis, you could have elevations in multiple leads, the morphology will be different. But for the purposes of this discussion, what we're looking at now, we're looking at contiguous leads, the one I circled here, right? And the coronary arteries that are involved with these uh, leads. And what you're going to be doing is when you see ST segment changes, um, um, then you're going to look at where it's occurring, which correlating, which coronary arteries involved, and what type of changes are you seeing? Are you seeing ST segment depression, are you seeing ST segment elevation? Are you seeing T wave inversions? And then uh, then you're gonna measure how much, how much elevation, how much depression. Usually when you have depression is usually uh, signifies ischemia, T wave inversions signifies ischemia. When you have these elevations as you see here, right? How this is elevated, right? This usually signifies there is uh, ongoing uh, injury, right? And an infarct is occurring. So we call this STEMI, right? ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. So let me just go back to this chart so that uh, we go through the basic ones and then we're just gonna start out the problem set. So as I was saying, right? You may have uh, your ba basic, right? Uh, MIs where there's no an additional coronary artery involved. So for example, here we see a lateral MI, right? Lateral MI. And you see ST segment elevation in leads one and AVL, as I was explaining. However, when you have enter lateral MI, right, you have in addition to one and AVL, you have uh, potentially ST segment elevations in leads V1 through V6. 
Why do you have that? Because it leads V1 through V6. This is left anterior descending. It feeds the anterior wall, right, as we were describing it. So that's why you will have, in addition to, right, A1 and AVL, these leads will be elevated. Anterior septal MI, uh, you see elevations in leads V1, V2. This is your true septal wall, plus possibility of V3. So the moment you start to branch out V3, V4, and so forth, then you have the anterior wall in, involvement, right? So anterior wall is uh, usually fed by the LAD. Anterior septal wall is LAD. Anterior lateral wall is LAD plus the circumflex, right? So which which one you guys think is uh, worse prognosis for the patient? Something like uh, a you know a lateral MI, with just leads one in AVL. Well, let's say uh, something like this, anterior lateral MI with V1 through V6, one in AVL. Which one? Anterior lateral. And why? Because it involves a greater amount of myocardium. It, it, it involves greater involvement of the myocardium. Also, you know what this tells me? If, if you see right in the anterior lateral, how you have V1 through V6, one in AVL, if you look at your coronary anatomy, right, you see how, let me just erase this part. You see how your circumflex uh, comes out all the way up proximally, right? This is your circumflex and this is your LAD. So if both of them are, are blocked, my lesion or my thrombus is somewhere over here. It has to be above this point so that it's occluding both of these coronary arteries. Certainly this is much more worrisome prognosis as opposed to if I have a pure pure, um, let's say, one in AVL lateral wall, maybe my lesion is downstream, so that at least blood is flowing here, and you know, and some of it is coming there, right? But if my thrombus is way up there, it's going to cut off circulation to both of the coronary arteries. When you heard the, you know, um, term of Widowmaker MI, this, this right here is a Widowmaker MI, because if I shut off this circulation, I will take out the left ventricle. If I take out the left ventricle and I don't reperfuse it, person is going to go into massive cardiogenic shock or they potentially can have a lethal dysrhythmia that they could die from this, right? So yes, the this is uh, this here is much more worrisome, right, than this. I'm not saying this is benign, this is not benign, but uh, in terms of the extent of the injury that this can sustain is much greater, right? So then... Going further in the list, we have the inferior wall MI. Uh, this is usually leads 2, 3, and AVF. That's classic, but you could. this is going to be the right coronary artery. You may also have the circumflex involvement, depending on the person, depending on their anatomy, right? Uh, you also have the inferior lateral MI, right, which is a combination of 2, 3, AVF, plus now you have the involvement of V5, V6, which is part of um, the circumflex and the lateral wall of your heart. Then uh, this is this is something you may have not learned. This is a little bit more uh, involved, right? Um, so you have true posterior. So when they say true posterior, what they truly saying is this. Let me just go back to this. So on this heart, when when you're applying the twelve leads around the the, the chest, right? The regular standard twelve lead, right? When you're putting, let's say, this is V one, V two, and then I make uh, my, you know, V three before and I go around this heart like this, truly speaking, I'm only looking at the anterior aspect and the lateral aspect of the heart, right? Uh, I could see the inferior wall uh, with these two, three AVF uh, limb leads, right? But I cannot see the posterior wall. I'm gonna take, let's say a blue color. This is the posterior wall, like in the back of the heart. You cannot see this with your standard 12 lead EKG. The only way you could see that posterior wall is if you do an EKG, uh, called 15 lead EKG, where you transpose the leads uh, from the standard 12 lead and you put them in the back. I'll show you the diagram how that looks like, right? But truly speaking, your standard 12 lead EKG is not looking at this posterior wall. But sure enough, you may have heart attacks that uh, could be isolated to the posterior wall, and I'll show you EKGs what that looks like. Now, uh, true posterior wall, right? They they say initial R waves, right? So. Let me give you an example. So this is your right. So P Q R S T. 
right waves so they say the initial r waves in v1 v2 are greater than 0.04 seconds so that's basically uh one small box so it's greater than that so the r to s ratio is greater or equal to one and right-sided ecg shows you 0.5 millimeters as t segment elevations v7 uh through v9 so you're like what is v7 through v9 so basically what they do is they will take off uh v4 v5 and v6 they will relabel them as v7 v8 v9 and they're going to put it on the posterior side uh, of the patient on the back right and they will look at the back uh wall the posterior wall of the heart i'll show you the diagram so you understand how this looks like the way it's done logistically you basically you basically first do a 12 lead ekg right with normal lead configuration then you take those leads you put them in the back you, you print another 12 lead but the moment it comes out you right away take a pen you cross out where it says v4 v5 v6 so like this was the ekg here right so here you would say v7 v8 v9 right right away you cross this out you put the corrected ones so that you are you know you don't forget to do it later because if you hand this ekg without doing that to another provider they would not know this is a 15 lead ekg with a posterior wall right so that's what you do this is uh looking at the you know back wall a posterior wall of the heart and this is the metrics they want so they want initial r waves in v1 uh, and v2 greater than one small box 0 0.04 seconds and right-sided ekg right a posterior wall v7 through v9 shows you at least 0.5 millimeters as the segment elevation and then you have right ventricular mi usually uh they will take the usually they look at one lead you could do you could do more if you want to uh they will take v4 right on your normal toilet they'll move it to the right side of the chest and they will call it v4r r stands for right sided leads here the reason they show you v3 through v6 they basically take you know uh v3 v4 v5 v6 and they basically put it on the right side of the chest then they relabel them as v4r v5r and v6r so that's what they did but truly speaking uh there is a study by aha they said v4r just one lead right you don't need to have all of them is over 80 percent specific um for right ventricular mi so you only need to do one of them you don't need to do all of them right so they will say rv right ventricular heart attack is usually seen by st segment elevations 23 avf right and also either st segment depression at lateral leads or st segment elevation in these right leads right and that makes sense uh right ventricle right we see here this is the the right ventricle is here right and uh the importance why do you want to obtain the right ventricular involvement right well let me ask you this question why is this important to obtain this right ventricular ekg why do we care about it so much that they put it here because it's easily missed it's it could be missed but there's another important reason there's a medication that you could give and if you give it without first confirming if they have rv involvement or not you could potentially kill them and that medication is in your protocol that you could give without medical control uh meaning you don't have to call anybody it's a nitro. 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 nitro right so exactly so nitroglycerin lowers lower lowers your preload it uh, dilates right vasodilation and if you vasodilate and you reduce the preload right look in, and you have right ventricular involvement let's say you had a massive right ventricular heart attack right where this ventricle is not pumping and i give you nitro right without checking this i will cause dilation of this superior and inferior vena cava i'll make these vessels bigger so if i make this diameter bigger the blood pressure drops in these vessels so there's less preload that's coming into your heart if I decrease the preload, right, and already weaken hard, I can essentially bottom you out to the point where you syncopy and I could potentially kill you. So my advice to you guys, right, in uh, as a, on the level of a paramedic, right, before you give nitrates, always you want to do a 12 lead EKG. And if you have inferior wall, MI, if you have 2-3 AVF elevations, before you give your nitro, right, you're going to check the blood pressure and you're going to do right side 12 lead so you're going to do v4r 
you're going to check the if there's right ventricular involvement so if if you have if you have positive right ventricular involvement i would withhold nitroglycerin i would not give it uh also even if they don't have this before our involvement all they have is two three avf elevated and the blood pressure is still above 100 right so your protocol can you can give it uh, nitroglycerin before you give it always have iv access established right and make sure your patient is on your stretcher laying or semi fowlers why because if you give this drug and this causes profound vasodilation and they pass out and you do not have iv access in place and the patient was not on your stretcher you will have hard time on your hands trying to establish iv access on a collapsed vasculature because the moment blood pressure drops the veins collapse you're not going to get that iv access right and then what you're going to be doing is you're going to be praying that your patient doesn't die right so before you give any nitrates to uh, establish a 12 lead right check your blood pressure if you have an two three avf elevation always do a right side ekg check out if there's right ventricular involvement if there is don't give nitrates if there's no right ventricular involvement right before you give it definitely make sure right uh, iv is in place you have uh, uh, IV bag right that's ready to be hung and the, the blood pressure is greater than 100 or otherwise you may have a dead patient on your hands right so this is just the where we're looking at the EKGs what it shows this next uh graph here is basically shows you Nick, yeah I'm sorry can I ask you a question can you go back to the previous table yeah okay so anterolateral um we're looking basically if uh, if you look at uh, the the strip uh we're looking at uh five six v5 v6 v3 v4 why is it say here we v1 through v v1 through v6 yeah the reason why is because anterior lateral right so the anterior wall right the anterior wall of the heart is fed by left anterior descending coronary artery right so lad and this is the LAD. So the anterior wall of the heart is fed by the LAD. And truly speaking, right, you could have, uh, if you take this vessel out, you will have changes. Like, so if you look at your 12 lead, you will have changes in, in all of these leads. Because even though they say it's a septal wall of the heart, it's fed by the LAD. All of this is LAD. Got it. right so if all of this is lad right then if you take out the lad and it's you know higher up here right then yeah this this is what it will take out so that's why they they give you the this whole you know v1 through v6 but you could have you could you could still have enter enter lateral mi with like v3 v4 v5 uh, you know or even v2 v3 v4 v5 v4 v5 one and avl so any combination of those uh will give you anterior lateral mi it's basically uh the you're looking at the vessel that's feeding that wall so that's why coronary anatomy becomes crucial to understand this hopefully that answers your question perfect right. thank you so, so the next chart they tell you they basically uh they looked at different uh studies uh and they wanted to draw this marker called you know specificity sensitivity so sensitivity sensitivity picks up uh those patients who actually have that mi that disease process so 90 percent who have the right coronary artery and the specificity tells you those patients who do not have that disease process so you want you want both sensitivity and specificity to be as high as possible but that's not you know you cannot always have that in the real world so let's see let's see what it shows you so here they say right st segment elevation and leads in lead three is greater than lead two so usually if you have that happening most likely your culprit is the right coronary right so three is greater than two you may also see right st segment depressions greater than one millivolts that's basically one box in leads v1 leads avl so those what they this here is actually reciprocal changes reciprocal changes is basically looking at the side of the heart opposite to where the mi is occurring and you will see the depressions occurring in uh, those leads. If you see that, that's very pathognomonic, meaning it's a good chance uh, this is a real deal. So anytime I have a 12 lead that just that has just elevations with no ST segment depressions, right? 
uh, you know, that's not as clear cut as with depressions, with the reciprocal changes. When you have reciprocal changes, that's almost pathognomonic of a, a, acute MI ongoing. ST segment elevations by itself could be a different disease process. For your purpose in the pre-hospital setting, any ST segment elevations, right, you're gonna be treating as acute MI. You're not gonna say, this is pericarditis, I'm not gonna give them any treatment. Because for, you, for, for your purpose, you wanna identify life-threatening uh, conditions, which MI would be, right? So for your purpose, even if you don't see ST segment depressions, but you see elevations, you're still gonna treat them, uh, you know, per the protocol, give them aspirin, you know, and uh, nitrates depending on the RV involvement, right? Uh, so, so this this up until this point shows you right inferior involvement. We see the right coronary. Next, we're gonna go to uh, pl with this top finding. So you have the this top box plus, in addition to you have elevations in V1 or V4R, right? So it, remember, I said V4R looks at the right side of the heart. That basically means that it's a pro proximal right coronary artery. So proximal means higher up, right? So proximal, higher up involvement. And you also see uh, this in uh, inferior MI, right? You may see Brady dysrhythmias. Why do you see Brady dysrhythmias? Let me show you this diagram, right? This is the right coronary artery that comes out. And you notice, right, the SA node and your AV node are also fed, right, by the right coronary artery. So if this coronary artery takes a hit, Right, these conduction pathways will not get blood supply. They don't get blood supply. They infarct. So then the the next branch will take over. So if SA node is taking out, then the AV node will kick in. AV node is taking out. You get the bundle branches and the Purkinje system, right, the ventricular system. Um, uh, some of the numbers you should keep in mind, right? SA node usually fires to 60 to 100. AV node 40 to 60, and then your ventricles, right, or the Purkinje system is 20 to 40. So if I come in and I got a person whose heart rate, let's say, is, you know, 44 beats per minute, and they're having chest pain, right, and I did a 12 lead, they have inferior wall MI, I know that the SA node took a hit and it's not functional, because if it was functional, my heart rate would, should be in this range, right, it would be 60 to 100. So if, if it's below that pacemaker rate, right, I know that the supply of blood is probably cut off there, right, so that's how you got to be thinking in terms of your assessments, right? Then if you have the absence of the above finding, but, right, you have ST segment elevations in lead one AVL, V5, V6, and ST segment depressions in the anterior or septal leads, that's most likely the left circumflex uh, that's involved. So you guys know this, right? One in AVL, we said it was the lateral wall, that's the circumflex. And in addition to it is if you have V5, V6, that's, yeah, circumflex coronary artery. Uh, this, uh, for some uh, patients, also feeds the inferior wall of the heart. So remember, inferior wall can be fed by the RCA uh, and also the circumflex, as I was explaining. Uh, the next, we're going to look at the ECG changes for your anterior wall, right? So we see ST segment elevations in V1, V2, V3, plus any, any features below. So one of them is ST segment elevations greater than 2.5 millimeters. By the way, the, the more elevations you got in millimeters, uh, the more suggestive of uh, more serious infarct, right? So the reason why we measure how many millimeters of elevation is that uh, we, that could tell us how the severity of the infarct. And usually, uh, right, if it exceeds one millimeter, that's enough for us to call it, you know, a STEMI. If it's, you know, usually greater than two millimeters elevation in contiguous leads, that usually buys them direct admit to the cath lab. Uh, so you'll bypass the ED uh, after your EKG transmission. By the way, um, I said this in my other lecture, in New York City specifically, I'm talking about in New York City only, right? Let's say you have a person and you diagnose that they have true, you know, 2.5 millimeters elevations, let's say in the anterior leads B1, V2, V3, like full blown MI guys saying I have chest pain, right? Now, uh, you you know you you are one block away from a uh, cath lab capable hospital. Should you initiate your transport day right away or not in New York City region only? So can anyone tell me? 
First, we have to call the telemetry to, to get the permission to which hospital we're going to go. And why why should you get permission? Why Because I'm the guy's having NMI. Why should I call telemetry? Why should maybe, I wait? Maybe this hospital is full. You don't have any more cardio surgeon uh, stuff to do this. Oh, the cat uh, uh, lab, is, the cast lab is, is not available right now. Excellent, right? So help me. Yeah, you are correct. So in New York City, right? Uh, the reason why you transmit the EKG is that the, the telemetry doctor is then going to contact that specific cath lab and they're going to determine if that uh, uh, doctor, right, uh, interventionist, uh, interventional cardiologist is actually there doing the procedure. Because if that person is not there, let's say they only work there from 9 to 5, or maybe they don't work on weekends, right, or they work Monday, Wednesday, Friday, right? You bring your patient there, they're going to basically sit there until a private ambulance company comes, picks up that patient, and then transports them to a different cath lab capable hospital. Uh, in addition to you will be restricted in New York City region as a paramedic if you do so. So just to clarify, in New York City, right, before you can take them to the cath lab, even though they have full blown MI, you determine that you must transmit your EKG to the telemetry doctor, and then they will tell you which uh, cath lab you're going to take them to, right? It might not be the closest because the physician may not be there at that particular time. Maybe you you got a guy with the MI on a weekend and the cath lab is closed on a weekend. So always transmit, always get authorization, right? Before you proceed with transport. Is, uh, hopefully that's clear. That's only for the New York City region. I've seen a lot of paramedics get restricted because of this. All right. So we talked about, uh, you know, the greater the extent, the the more severe it is, right? So they sh the, here they shape pro proximal left anterior descending. So proximal means higher up. Anything anything that's proximal as opposed to distal is more worrisome, right? Anything proximal higher up includes more of a coronary. So there's um, is going to be a bigger problem. And then we as we make our way down here, we see ST segment depression greater than one millimeter and leads to three AVF, that's your reciprocal changes, right? So it's probably proximal left anterior descending if you see these reciprocal changes in addition to elevations in one V2, V3. Uh, then you see ST segment depression or ST segment elevations in the two, three AVF. Uh, this is in addition to these leads, right? This could signify distal left anterior descending, um, right? Because it's less than one millimeter. so or equal to, right? So that's why we said the extent uh, of it does matter. Uh, and then you have uh, findings of left coronary lesions. So this here is not per se true, truly uh, ST segment elevation, right? Uh, here you will see Wallen sign, this is basically biphasic T waves. Uh, I will show you how they look like on EKGs. They usually happen in the V1, V2 leads. And they will be, uh, uh, when, when they say biphasic, it means like the the T wave kind of does something like this as you know goes up and over the isoelectric line. I'll show you how it looks like. So that's usually uh, indicative of uh, proximal uh, coronary artery lesion. So there's a uh, blockage there. And also, right, you see how you have AVR greater than 0 0.5 millimeters elevations only in AVR, right? Uh, so AVR, if you look here, right, usually it's not associated. It's not um, contiguous with any leads. It's usually uh, the opposite view, right? Uh, because the the natural impulse of your heart, right? If this is if this is your heart, your the way it, we measure the EKG, usually the, the it's picking up signal, right, from your cells, right, going down this way. That's why most of these are upright and this is reversed. You see how it's kind of looking the other way as opposed to all other leads? It's like the opposite. And the reason why is that AVR is higher up. So any signal that's traveling away from, from a lead is going to show you a negative deflection on it. But there may be cases where this here is elevated. I'll show you EKGs of that. So you may have elevations. And if that's occurring, right, that's very pathognomonic of anterior uh, MI and blockage of the left coronary artery. So you will see, right, greater than 0 0.5 millimeters elevations in AVR and also... Uh, greater or equal one millimeter elevations in lead V1. I'll show you how it looks like. Like so, they will say right, it's left coronary artery or severe multi vessel disease. So multiple vessels are involved, uh, and that's very worrisome. Right? Any questions about this chart before we start the problem set?
Okay, so we're gonna start the um, discussing the problem set. I'll just show you. Right, I was explaining what what was the V4R and the 15 lead EKG. So normally, as you guys know, right, the EKG is is looking at this angle, right, that I'm drawing to get your right sided, right. Uh, view right or to see if there's right ventricular involvement all you do is basically you take the v4 from your left side you move it to your right side on the same location right fifth in the costal space mid clavicular line right and then you run your 12 lead once it comes out you basically relabel v4 as v4r so that's v4r uh, now to get the posterior wall right what you can do is you take v5 and v6 and you basically disconnect them from here and you place them on the patient's back, right? So how it looks, you, you basically move it here, right? So this would be your V5 and this would be your six. It goes below the scapula and it's looking at the posterior wall. So here, right, they'll say V8 goes fifth intercostal space, mid scapula line. So if this is your scapula, it's in the middle, right? And then V9 go, uh, goes in between v8 and the spine so you find the spine right you could palpate it and then you put it right there so v5 and v6 that were on the anterior leads you basically move them to the back and then you relabel them as v8 and v9 so if this was my if this was let me go back to the ckg if i did that here first i do the standard one right i do the standard ekg so this is my first one i keep everything labeled as this then if I did the right-sided one, I'm going to relabel this as V4R. V5 is going to be V8, and this is going to be V9. This lead in itself is sufficient enough to tell me if there's right ventricular involvement. These two are sufficient enough to tell me that there is uh, involvement of the posterior wall, right? Here you only need uh, 0.5 millimeter elevation. Uh, you don't need to have a full box. So V4R is specific enough for that, right? Any questions about uh 15 lead dkg when do you want to run the 15 lead dkg at, at, at what type of mi acute one acute mi yeah, of course they're all acute <laughs> help me they're all acute mis but when when i do i want to do 15 lead dkgs all the time uh, is it anterior lateral uh if it's uh, not if it's anterior lateral, if it's, if it's inferior, right? If it's inferior, you have elevations in 2-3 AVF or you have ST segment depressions in anterior leads, V1 through V4. So if you see anything like this on your uh, 12 lead, why, why do I say you want to do this? When you have inferior 2-3 AVF, why do I want to do this when I have ST segment depressions V1, V4? It's because, look, if you look at your coronary anatomy, right? Right here. Let me make this clear so you guys can see. The 15 EK, the 15 EDKG shows me what's going on in the back wall of the heart, the posterior wall, right? The posterior wall of the heart is fed usually by this vessel, the right coronary vessel. So if I have a blockage here, right, it's not feeding my, uh, you see here, right, the right ventricle. This is the right ventricle. So I will have right ventricular involvement. And then if this, the posterior branch, the posterior descending artery that is now in the back of the heart, it's, it's cut off because this branch is cut off, then I may have a heart attack in the back of my heart. So the reason why you want to do the 15 lead EKG in this setting is because if right coronary artery is blocked, Right, I will have right ventricular, possibly right ventricular involvement, possible posterior wall involvement, right? So remember, two, three, AVF. Elevations. So I got a question. I got a yeah. question, right? So yeah. the, um, the right uh, coronary artery, right? Mm -hmm. It comes down, and you said it also feeds to the back. So yeah. if there's a blockage and you see a blockage, uh, and you notice it in the uh, two, three AVF when you initially do your EKG. Mm -hmm. Will it? Will that automatically just let you know because the coronary, uh, right coronary artery, also feeds blood to the um to the back? When it also just make it, you know, yeah. just like okay, it's there because it's blocking the entire, it's blocking the artery already. 
So remember, right, 2,3 AVF, those are limb leads, right? So when you're talking about 2,3 AVF, it's limb leads. So truly speaking, when you have 2,3 AVF elevations, you could have a blockage just here. It feeds the inferior portion of the heart. So you could have a distal blockage. You could still have 2,3 AVF elevations that are occurring with this type of blockage. I'll still do 15 lead EKG, right, to make sure I don't have right ventricular involvement and posterior wall. But if your lesion is proximally here, then you see how much more I could potentially take out. So 2-3 AVF basically looks at the inferior aspect, right? And also 2-3 AVF, right, uh, can mean, right, you have either right coronary involvement or you could have this, this, you see how the circumflex also can feed the inferior wall. So it could be RCA, it could be the circ. So when you have 2-3 AVF elevations, you're not truly sure right uh, until you do a 15 lead EKG in terms of what's going on this 2-3 AVF can give you information that there is could be distal RCA could be distal circumflex right but if I did a 15 lead EKG and I also saw elevations in uh, V4R and elevations in your posterior leads which we said was V8 and V9 then I know that my my block is somewhere probably higher up that it's taking out the ventricle side and there's posterior descending artery that's involved. Does that make sense? Okay, I, it makes sense now, thank you. All right, you're welcome. All right, so that's that's how we're gonna look at that. So 15 lead EKG, uh, when you have inferior wall MI, right, you wanna basically see if you have right ventricular involvement, you have the posterior wall. So you basically, again, uh, run the 12 lead, relabel them, right? You take your V4, sorry, V5 and V6, on the standard EKG, put them in the back, right? The fifth intercostal space mid scapula line. This is where your V5 goes, and then the uh, when you do V uh, uh, V9, it goes basically in between V8 and the spine. So here, V8, V9. This is where they're going to be. You're going to run your standard 12 lead again. You're going to relabel the new leads, right? So how it's going to look? This is how it's going to look, right? So you notice here, this they had elevations two, three AVF, right? You see that? And they also had depressions in V1, V2. So they, they are thinking, all right, do we have right ventricular involvement? Should I give this guy nitro? Do we have posterior wall? So they don't know that based on this lead per se, right? So they did the right side EKG. They did right side V4R. Okay, you see how it's elevated? Right? Then they said, okay, do I have posterior wall? Right, look at these V8, V9. These are all elevated. Right, so here this shows me that I have inferior wall MI. I also have uh, right ventricular involvement, and I definitely know this is the real deal because I have reciprocal changes. You see how the lateral leads have depressions, right? So this guy will go straight to the cath lab, no questions asked, right? With this type of EKG. So does that make sense? Fifteen lead EKG. Hey, can is you that normally done in the field? Sorry? What was the question? Is it normally done in the field? So uh, I, I normally did it in the field. I know you'll have some, uh, you'll have some crazy looks. I'll show, you a, I'll show you an EKG a little later on in this, um, in this question set where I actually did it in the field. And uh, at that time, uh, if you guys recall, you know, you know, the Joey is the instructor who is the a medical instructor here. He was my EMT partner. And he looked at me like I was crazy. Uh, like I didn't know where the leads go. So we did the 15 EDKG and the person had in, uh, posterior wall MI and we went straight to the cath lab, right? So I'll show you that from a real call, right? So is it done routinely? Uh, I don't know because I, uh, you know, when you work, uh, you know, you're there with another medical, another EMT. I done it routinely when I had when I had elevations here, so when I have when I saw this, or I saw depressions in these leads, I would do the 15 lead EKG. Okay. You can explain that again for me, please. Uh, the, so this slide, please. Which slide? The 15 lead ECG. This one right there. No, no, this no. One? No, the one after. The one after. This one. Yes. What about? What about it? How you like? When you see the elevation in lead one, two, three, you have to do the 15 lead ECG. That's correct? 
when you see elevations in two, three, and AVF, or you see depressions here, here, in your anterior leads, right? I would do the 15 lead. Okay, then elevation in lead one, two, three, and depression no, in V1. Elevations in two, three AVF. Elevations in two. In two, three AVF. Yeah, okay. let me write it down. Two, three AVF, right? Elevation, or you have depression in anterior lead. So like V1 through V3. Like you see here, right? So if I had any of these, any of these, either the elevations in, in these leads or the pressions in these leads, I would do a 15 lead EKG. And this is what I want to look at. I want to look at V4R, V8, V9. I want to see if I have elevations in, in these leads. When we're, switching I, the, when we're switching the leads from the front to the back. Yeah, exactly. Okay. You see how, you see how they, they uh, this, was your, this was your normal EKG here, right? On the right, on the, on the left side of the heart. They take yes. the V4 from here, right? They basically move it on the same location on the right side of the chest, right? So, and they relabel it V4R. So they say V4R, R stands for right side. For right then, side, yes. Yeah, then they take V5 and V6, your normal standard leads. They put them in the back like this. Okay. They put them in the back like this, right? So this would be your V5 and V6, and they basically relabel it as V8 and V9. When we do a practice in the lab, if you, any of you guys want to volunteer uh, and you don't mind taking off your shirt, we can run about 15 lead on you guys so you see how it looks. Thank you. All right. So this is how it prints out. Very important that you relabel it because if you don't relabel it, the let's say you give it to a doctor, you transmit, and the machine will, is not going to print how you see it printed here before. R, V8, V9, it's not going to do it. It's going to say V4, it's going to say V5, and it's going to say V6. It's your responsibility to relabel them because then the doctor looking at it is going to be very confused because they all think it's a standard configuration. Okay? Uh, all right. So, and then uh, this, is, this is basically your um, current AHA guidelines, right, uh, in terms of um, what, what's going on. I... I'm uh, going to post the slides. It's a little more clear on that. It, I think the image didn't come out as clear cut. So when you have a patient who is having chest pain, right, upon EMS arrival, it's you want to make sure you get early 12 leads so you could see if there is elevations. Why is this important? Because you're going to be calling a STEMI notification if, if there is, right? You're going to activate the STEMI alert. And then the other important factor, which you want to obtain, right, I was explaining, uh, you want to, on the onset, and you want to get the time. So onset, was it gradual? Was it sudden, right? And your OPQRSTI questions. And your time, you want to know when the time, the patients began experiencing symptoms of chest pain, right? And the reason why this is important is if they're less than or equal to 12 hours of this time of duration, they're going to have some reperfusion goals. And the goal is basically, if it's less than 12 hours of the symptom onset, uh, and you're going to bring them to the hospital. The moment you hit the doors, you walked in through the doors, right? You're going to have something known as a door to balloon inflation, right? Or you're going to say uh, door to needle time, right? So what does that mean? It means that the moment you present the patient to the hospital and they're having ST segment elevation, that's less than 12 hour in duration. The hospital has uh, equal, a less than or equal to 90 minutes to place a balloon or a stent. And if they cannot do that within 90 minutes, they have 30 minutes to start thrombolytics. So that means the following. Let's say you take a person to the wrong facility, right? That is not cath lab capable. You never called online medical control and you just took them to a hospital that you thought had a cath lab or you take this person to uh, a hospital that does not have cath lab capabilities. You basically took them to the 911 receiving. Uh, that hospital, if they cannot transfer this person fast enough, uh, they have to give them thrombolytics. And the problem with thrombolytics is that it doesn't only break up clots in your heart, it can break up clots all over, right? Whereas placing a balloon and a stent, it's more isolated, right? Uh, and it's uh, more effective for these patients. They're going to salvage more myocardium, right? So th this is basically this. Then the doctor is playing, you know, what do I do? Do I give them thrombolytics or I make the transport uh, if it's prolonged? 
uh, greater than 90 minutes, then the possibility of being sued. So the patient can sue them. They will win that most likely because they didn't follow the protocols. They didn't follow the guidelines, right? So it's very important for you guys to determine that it was less than or equal to 12 hours of uh, symptom onset. You take them to the facility that actually has cath lab capabilities. You call online, online medical control, right? Call online medical control and get permission. Um, and take them to the cath lab capable facility. So that's the major stuff that I have here. If they're, if they're past the 12 hour mark, right? I, I would still take them to the cath lab capable facility, right? And they're gonna measure their troponins, they're gonna trend it, and they're gonna maybe admit them to the CCU and do other uh, treatments there, right? The other time where you need to do a 12 EDKG is post cardiac arrest. So ROSC stands for return of circulation, return of spontaneous circulation, it means you got the pulses back, and we're gonna see here, right, 12 EDCG. So why do we, why is this important? Why do we get a 12 EDCG upon return of pulse? Is the patient still unstable? So it's, it's not per se in, uh, instability. You want to determine the cause Maybe of cardiac arrhythmia. Yeah. yeah, you want to, the, the reason you obtained holy DKG is you want to determine the cause of cardiac arrest. So if you had a person who went into a cardiac arrest secondary to a heart attack, and that could happen because an uh, ischemic heart, right? A heart that's not getting blood supply is going to become irritable and it's going to cause dysrhythmias. So any type of new breakout dysrhythmia secondary to ischemia, I would strongly suspect NMI, right? So MI may have occurred. So they went maybe to into VTAC, ventricular tachycardia, secondary to ischemic heart, to a lesion, thrombus. So then when you get pulses back, right, you do a total EDKG to see if they got a STEMI. And the reason why I want to see if they got a STEMI, because if they got a STEMI, this is going to recur. They may, again, get another arrhythmia. It may go back into cardiac arrest. The only way to make sure they don't re-arrest is that we got to take them to the cath lab capable facility. So they opened that lesion with a balloon and a stent. So the moment you get pulses back, you do a 12 EDKG. And I'm looking if I have elevations in the ST segment. If I have ST segment elevation, I send this to online medical control. I say, I got a guy, you know, 75 year old male, post cardiac arrest, we got pulses back. 12 it shows me uh, inferior wall MI or whatever MI, anterior lateral MI. Here's the EKG. We would like to take them to the cath lab capable facility. Please let us know which facility is available. So you're going to be with online medical control, and that's what you're going to do. By the way, when you call telemetry, you're first going to get a paramedic answering the phone. You're not going to get to a doctor right away. So what you want to say is call it. You want to tell you don't want to tell them the story. You know, you just tell them your unit number and what you're calling for. So you'll say, you know, uh, 3 1 x ray calling for decision for uh, 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 um, cath lab. Uh, transport or STEMI transport. So then the, they know right away to cue you in the call as opposed to somebody's waiting for securing RMA, right? Securing RMA is not as important as if you're calling for STEMI transmission, you know? So that's, it's important to state that right away when you call up the, the telemetry desk. All right. Uh, all right, so any questions before we start the problem set? Yeah, uh, Brian, so you had a question? question? Yeah. Uh so Go in ahead. in class we were looking at the different arrhythmias and less so the ST segments. How do those fit together? Like, would you have a regular sinus rhythm with an ST elevation? Like, how I I don't see how those fit together. Yeah. So so to answer your question, you may have various underlying rhythm with ST segment elevation. So the you could have. Uh, you know, sinus rhythm, you can have sinus bradycardia, you can have sinus tachycardia, you can have heart block, one, two, three, right? You could have uh, all types of uh, active P PACs, PVCs. So the 12 lead ECG, where you're measuring ST segment, right? Uh, this is not interpreting your underlying rhythm. So your underlying rhythm can vary depending what your lead two shows, right? So usually before getting a 12 lead, you're gonna do, let's say lead two and you're gonna run your EKG, right? So you get the basic underlying rhythm. And then you're looking at the 12 lead to tell you if there's any segment, ST segment deviation up or down. So to answer your question, the, the underlying rhythm could vary depending on the person presentation. For example, I have inferior wall MI, right? I took out my right coronary artery higher up. I took out my SA node, right? And I took out my AV node, you may have a patient who has very bradycardic. They may be in a heart block, right? So you have two problems. You have to deal with the heart block and the MI. So you may have concomitant problems. 
I know it's a little complicated now, but uh, let's now let's learn the basics, right? So if, if I was studying this first, I'm going to learn the basic rhythms, right? Your, um, you know, interpretation, right? What's VTEC, VFib, hard blocks, Brady dysrhythmias, Tachy dysrhythmias. Then I want to look at ST segment deviations and the coronary arteries they involve. And then eventually you're going to have to put it all together, right? Because you may have a patient with a third degree hard block and an and a, and a inferior wall MI because his right SA node is out, his AV node is out, and he's showing you this type of rhythm plus a third degree hard block in, your, in, the, in the lead two, right? So they could compound. I see. Okay. Any other questions?